Welcome to AI, Government and the Future, a podcast by Corner Alliance. We explore the intersection of artificial intelligence, government and the future. We work with government to create results. We ignite your agency's mission by helping you to design and implement high impact and innovative federal programs in AI, broadband, cybersecurity, public safety, and more. Being a government ally is at the core of all we do. All right. Welcome in, everybody. My name is Max Romanek. I will be your host on today's podcast. We are honored to have Mina Narayanan with us on the show today. She is a distinguished researcher at the forefront of artificial intelligence assessment and responsible AI frameworks. She is currently serving as a research analyst at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology through Georgetown University. Mina's work is crucial in shaping the standards and policies governing AI systems. Her expertise spans from developing procedural tools for AI evaluation and contributing to AI standards and testing, making her an invaluable voice in the discourse on AI's societal impacts. With an academic foundation in public policy and management from Carnegie Mellon University and software engineering from Auburn University, Mina's insights are vital for anyone interested in the intersection of AI, government, and future technologies. Welcome to the show, Mina. Thank you so much for having me. Really looking forward to the conversation. I'll get us started sort of at the high level. Um, Your work with the Center for Security and Emerging Technology really involves studying how to assess AI systems and manage their risk. Uh, I was hoping you could give us an overview of the current landscape of AI assessment and some key challenges you've encountered in ensuring AI systems are beneficial and not prone to harmful behavior. First, I think it's important to understand that AI assessment is rapidly changing and rapidly evolving. However, there is sort of convergence around two high-level points. The first is that foundation models or models that are trained, AI models that are trained on um, vast amounts of data and can perform a variety of downstream tasks really require a different approach to assessment than AI systems that perform more narrow tasks and and require less compute and less data. And this is because foundation models can exhibit something called emergent capabilities, where sort of after steadily increasing the amount of compute that these systems are trained on, they can exhibit pretty large jumps in performance on specific tasks, such as a modular arithmetic or unscrambling words. Because these systems, these foundation models, can also be used in virtually unlimited numbers of, of settings, their sort of risk profile really expands. And so accounting for, you can imagine that accounting for all of those different risks is quite challenging compared to maybe the risks that an AI system that can only distinguish between cats and dogs. The second point where I've seen some convergence or quite a bit of convergence on is that AI systems, uh, the testing of AI systems should be proportional to the risk that the system poses. So for example, testing should probably be much more rigorous for an AI system that diagnoses cancer versus the example I just used, an AI system that can distinguish between dogs and cats. However, this sort of sounds very deceptively simple. It's actually quite hard to determine what tests need to be done based on the risks that a a system could pose. There's a lot of disagreement about even kind of what risks there are. And there's also not a generalizable evaluation framework for AI systems. It's sort of unclear who should do what kinds of testing and when. That's really interesting in terms of there not being general agreement on sort of like what risks quantify, like what sort of um, decision-making factors are you using in, in trying to approach those sort of problems in determining something as baseline threshold as what level of risk are we dealing with here leading to that calibration of testing? Standards for incident reporting sort of seek to address this problem that you can't always anticipate AI risks that may emerge until an AI system has been deployed in the real world. And so those kinds of standards are really focused on how do we collect data on harm that has occurred or maybe nearly occurred in the real world in order to prevent those harms from occurring in the future. And so those standards 
can help experts and evaluators sort of gather data on maybe what risks are, are more plausible in the short term versus the long term. And even testing itself, experimenting with testing, can help provide more evidence around what kinds of risks should AI practitioners and policymakers be prepared for down the road. There's also a class of speculative risks, too, that don't really have as much evidence undergirding them. And those risks have, have also been receiving a lot of attention in this space. So by way of just an example, like, like what are some of those AI behavioral risks that, that you've encountered in your research so far? So on the existential risks, when you hear people refer to these kinds of risks, they're usually talking about scenarios where AI systems are able to deceive the humans that are operating the system where they're sort of able to escape the, the confines of the organization that, that they're sort of employed in service of. There have also been sort of concerns that, you know, incorporating sort of just using AI in very, in settings that are incredibly consequential. You can think sort of deploying a nuclear weapon. What, what are kind of some of the things that could go wrong if an AI system is sort of able to make some of these decisions by itself and isn't actually sort of sharing its decision-making process with an operator or the other, other human decision-makers in the room. Now, we're already seeing plenty of harm from AI systems in the real world. There is a, a great resource out there called the AI Incident Database that actually sort of catalogs and organizes media reports that have reported on situations where AI has done something wrong. There's a really potent example in reporting in there of a faulty AI system that was used to actually sort of streamline allocating government benefits to people, but ended up unfairly denying those benefits to certain groups of people. And these were marginalized groups and groups that, that were underrepresented. And so we see a lot of talk about what could happen in the future, but it's also important to recognize what is happening right now. So can you provide a sort of an example of like in that realm of AI standards, how does that actively combat those sort of potential harms that we see from the, the spectrum you just described? So first, at a high level, standards are basically common repeatable ways of doing something. And they are considered key components of good governance because they can promote interoperability, they can build trust in systems, they can um, support market equity, help both emerging and established players conduct consistent performance management and evaluation. And so there's a whole host of benefits to building standards. Standards for testing can help sort of stakeholders implement consensus-based best practices. Um, and they can also help consumers build trust in different technologies and services because they know that these technologies and services adhere to some set of consensus-based requirements. So standards for testing can help specifically AI developers perform an adequate amount of testing and do that testing in consistent ways. Standards for incident reporting can actually help us understand where there are gaps in standards for testing. Where are we still seeing harms emerge in maybe areas that have well-established standards? And that could be an indicator that those standards aren't efficient. So I guess in an example then of like trying to remove bias and ensure fairness for whatever the task is that, that a, a given AI model has been trained on, how do we use those standards to try to address that? I totally understand the perspective you're, you're saying around providing that predictability, the reliability, interoperability of the technology itself. But like when you're actually trying to use those standards to attack potential harmful outcome, what exactly does the interplay look like there? So testing for different kinds of harms or, or equity and bias, bias concerns really needs to take place throughout the AI system lifecycle because bias can sort of rear its head at different points in the AI system lifecycle. So you can imagine during the data set curation phase, um, 
where developers are sort of building this data set to train an AI model, there may be certain groups that are over or underrepresented in that data set during training while, while actually building the model itself. It can learn biased sort of correlations or relationships between inputs, the data, and its outputs. And continuing along that thread, once these models are engaging with the real world, they can produce disparate outcomes. And so these testing standards really need to account for different life cycle stages and articulate what actions should happen at each of those different stages. It's interesting in the context of bias within AI systems, this, this concept of a human in the loop, just put a human in the loop to oversee these systems and make sure they're not creating disparate outcomes. That has sort of been treated as a silver bullet to solving some of these fairness issues. But the problem with that is humans are biased. We're biased and we're also able to infuse sort of bias throughout these different decision-making stages. And so really an AI system that's used to maybe vet job candidates that is overseen by a human being, the testing for that should probably be just as rigorous as the testing for an AI system that does that same function but isn't overseen by a human being. Do you see any sort of disparate outcomes focusing more on one phase or another in an AI development life cycle? Or is it sort of even treatment, even results on the other side? Yeah, I think it really depends on the AI system, AI system itself. So it can certainly materialize at every stage, but it's possible that an AI system that's trained on a really huge data set. It could be that you know, groups are pretty equally distributed throughout that data set, but the system itself is able to, through training, seize on some of those biased patterns within the data, which are really oftentimes human biases and sort of act on those when deployed in, in the real world. So it, it really sort of depends on the type of system, how much data it's trained on, how complex the architecture is, how easy is it, is it to actually sort of interrogate how it's identifying patterns in the data. And, and so really seeing bias kind of manifest more in one stage than another gets a little tricky. Gotcha. That makes a, a lot of sense. You know, like in our client space, we work with a lot of law enforcement type of problems and law enforcement data sets going back to the beginnings of the record keeping are really subject to whatever the law enforcement strategies were at that period of time. And historically, there's been some troublesome models that have been used throughout the history of law enforcement for that sort of thing. We now know this looking backwards historically that, that those data sets are going to contain that sort of inherent bias in the way a lot of that stuff is operational. How would you approach a problem like that where you know that the training data set you have is not a pure situation? Like there's information in there you absolutely want, you absolutely need. It contains the history of how we've performed law enforcement, but there's also going to be these traps and gotchas that are just going to pop out all the time because of the way that the differences in law enforcement in the 70s, law enforcement in the 80s, it was done differently. And so obviously the records that reflect those strategies are going to represent those differences. How do you make use of something like that in a, in a more modern system where you're trying to have more equal and fair treatment across the board? There's no easy answer to that. I think first it's important to include a diverse group of stakeholders at sort of the, the ideation phase and, and consider really what is the objective here? Putting building an AI system aside, what is the objective? Is it to make communities safer? Is it to sort of reduce recidivism? Is it to streamline law enforcement operations? And is AI even something that can assist with that? And what do we mean when we say we want to improve a certain outcome? Are we looking to develop a system that performs better than, say, an average human at that task? And what does an average human look like when performing that task? Is it okay if the system performs somewhat worse than an average person because maybe resources are, are tight and there's no one to sort of fill that role? So I think that question really would involve consulting a lot of different stakeholders and thinking more deeply about 
what organizational infrastructure, what resources do we currently have in place to solve this problem? And is this proposed solution really the best fit to the problems that we've identified? Let me follow up to that. In a situation where you're looking to try to have AI standards operational through government actors, what level of effective communication or enforcement across those different levels of government do you think is the right balance to try to achieve those positive outcomes here? So standards are a good first step, but if they're not implemented effectively or sort of consistently, then they really aren't sort of serving their, their original purpose. And so within the government, there are you know, hundreds of different agencies. It can be really hard to coordinate different functions across these agencies. And so maybe the solution is to have something like an AI compliance office, perhaps housed within the Commerce Department, that can really start building relationships with different government agencies and begin defining technical processes and bringing in uh, technical experts to help agencies actually understand what standards implementation might look like within their different contexts. Importantly, this kind of an office could be separate from any type of enforcement arm to sort of encourage agencies to proactively share problems that they're running into with the office and sort of encourage communication and information sharing about how these standards are actually being operationalized and what, what the impact is across the U.S. government as a whole. Have you seen any efforts akin to that, either in the U.S. government space or internationally? Are there any other governments or non-governmental, but, um, you know, sort of political authority entities that you've seen attempt to uh, accomplish such a thing? Yeah, so this sort of idea is actually modeled on something that the Occupational Safety and Health Administration does, where this organization sort of helps set workplace safety standards, and, and they actually have a compliance arm and an enforcement arm. And they keep these functions separate to encourage sort of enterprises that are maybe that want to, you know, make their workplaces safer, but are maybe struggling to comply with some of those requirements. They invite those organizations to, to seek out help and to get help for, for compliance assistance before sort of enforcing any sorts of penalties. And I think such a proactive approach could be adopted or AI as well. Okay. I certainly know that that sort of function for construction and safety hazards and all that, like that's, it's created now a whole supporting subsidiary industry around safety products and trying to keep people safe. How do you think the private marketplace would respond in this AI context? Do you think the software development firms and everybody are going to have a positive look on something like that? Or do you think there would be open rebellion in the digital streets, so to speak? Companies have actually been pushing for regulation and some certain kinds of regulation and more guidance on kind of what should they expect coming down the pipeline. There have been voluntary commitments by companies to evaluate their systems and monitor harms that are occurring. But companies also have some valid concerns around certain standards and regulations. And so Oftentimes, these concerns center around reputational harm. So if I'm reporting on something that went wrong within my company, how is that going to look to the public? How is that going to hurt my consumer base and my bottom line? And this is where I think ideas like whistleblower protection programs and sort of anonymous reporting programs can come into play and potentially help alleviate some of those concerns. So professional organizations like the Association for Computing Machinery and IEEE, they could possibly play a role in sort of encouraging basically protecting employees of companies from retaliation by sort of instating and facilitating these whistleblower protection programs. And they could also help facilitate anonymous reporting programs where reports couldn't be traceable to individual companies. And so they wouldn't be as concerned about reputational risks. And these reports could be made available to policymakers and regulators in the future in 
a summary format. So they at least maintain some baseline level of awareness around what are companies, what are the problems that they're engaging with on the ground. Do you see any potential concerns around having a very advanced private sector trying to advise a lagging government sector on what regulations would be most appropriate to govern its own operations? Definitely. It's important to sort of think about the different incentives that are at play. So it would make sense that a lot of the more uh, most powerful tech companies would advocate for regulations and, and guidance that really solidifies their lead in this space and maybe shuts out startups or sort of emerging players. It also makes sense that maybe small and medium-sized enterprises building AI systems who are wanting to gain a foothold in this space that maybe they want to advocate for standards and guidance that can be easily implemented across the board, regardless of really what resourcing you currently have in place. With that said, though, industry can play a really valuable role in advising the government on certain issues and making sure the government stays abreast of these problems. So the October 30th AI executive order requires companies developing dual-use foundation models that are trained on vast amounts of computational resources to provide reports on you know, the evaluations of, that they're conducting. And this can really help the government track trends in AI, AI harm and see where further investigation is, is warranted. There are examples of other companies, Scale AI, for instance, that have partnered with different, Scale AI specifically has partnered with the Chief Digital and AI Office to help build a test and evaluation framework for large language models. And so it's about striking that balance between, okay, how do we bring in some of this technical expertise to the government where we desperately need more technical talent while remaining aware of some of the incentives and motivations that might be at play for what player companies are suggesting. And do you think that the government's own use of some of these techniques and capabilities is going to inform that? Sometimes, you know, the government regulator gets to stand from the activity that they're regulating, but in this case, feels like there's a likely outcome where they would be both a regulator and a potential consumer of the sort of product that they're also aiming to regulate. Do you think that there's any sort of tension there that we would need to be aware of? And especially when you're setting standards and test evaluations, like is that a consideration that would need to be made transparently in trying to build out those sort of tools? It could be. And I will say, I don't see so much of attention as rather than an, more of an incentive for government agencies to gain more insight into how these systems are working. Because if they employ them in their daily operations to serve the American public, I mean, of course, they want to be certain that these systems are robust to a certain extent and aren't going to go to go haywire. I sort of see those roles as operating more in concert than in conflict. You can sort of see something similar to that in the way that we do financial regulations. You know, those are mostly transparency mechanisms, but the transparency mechanism forced on a private sector company for reporting on its performance annually. Government also purchases those the products and services. So Microsoft has to tell you all of the stuff that's going on with it. The government then purchases Microsoft products. And so that, that sort of is a cycle that seems like it could be replicated here. And it seems to be working at least decently well in order to enforce some degree of of standardization and expectations and predictability in the financial markets. And so if we're looking at trying to set up something similarly here, that seems like a model that we could potentially go down. I think with standards too, there are so many opportunities to draw lessons learned from other industries and see what might work as is, what might need to be modified a bit. Going to school on some of those other industries might avoid some of the uh, cataclysms there. You know, the financial regulations work pretty well. We only had to go through a major depression to get them. Maybe we can avoid that in the AI space. <laughs> Do you think that there's going to be any effect in this space as more advanced capabilities become commonplace? I'm thinking about things like quantum computing. What sort of effect might that have on our standards and test evaluation frameworks? I'm not too familiar with quantum computing actually itself. But I think 
if standards are to remain adaptable to changing technology, they will need to be focused on certain application areas and achieving certain outcomes rather than over-indexing on the technology itself. Now, this actually raises an interesting tension because one could argue in order to have true interoperability, which is really an enabler of a lot of sort of economic and productivity benefits of standards, you have to focus on the technical details. They have to work as expected. But these technical standards are going to be less resilient as research and, and understanding around what the technology should be evolves over time. And so it's all about sort of striking a balance. And this seems to be sort of a recurring theme in this, in this conversation where nothing is quite black and white. It's always a spectrum and it's always sort of a, a cost benefit analysis in a way. There's also infrastructure that can be put in place to monitor the effectiveness of standards and see how resilient they are to this technology changing over time. One example is sort of creating test beds for standards themselves and stress testing them on different technologies and, and having companies and other entities come in and, and see with some sort of a you know liability shield where if they show that their systems actually aren't complying with certain standards or requirements, they're actually protected temporarily in that space from any costs there. But an agency like NIST or maybe a new agency could serve that role. That's very interesting. Certainly there are models for that in the federal government. There are R&D programs that offer liability shields for certain types of sponsored research, anti-terrorism activities and, and those sorts of things. You know, I think that there's an argument to be made there around this being another sort of qualifying research area. And in order to spur innovation, providing some liability answers could be very interesting there for sure. I hope you won't mind. This is another one of those more theoretical questions, but same kind of question instead of it being more advanced technology that's coming down the pike. What about changing societal needs? Would that potentially flip things or, or change the way that we would need to look at a standards set or test and evaluation framework? Would you mind elaborating a little bit on what kinds of societal needs are you thinking about? I mean, I'm thinking very broadly. It is my assumption that as we start to adopt more and more AI into our daily lives, that that's going to have an effect on the way that we operate, both as a macro society and in, in small relational groups. I could see there being different use cases being brought forward, people wanting to use AI for a whole manner of different functions, some of which are probably commonplace and rather banal, and some of which might be completely radical. And so being that, again, it's another one of those sort of semi-unknown areas we're making best guesses based on trends that we see happening now, do you think that that is a function that might really massively affect the way that we treat the areas that are sort of central to your research? Certainly. It's possible that in a few years that AI is increasingly integrated into high-risk domains. And so there could be sort of an appetite from policymakers to actually turn what are kind of voluntary standards into regulation or increasingly use standards to interpret some of these high-level principles that we, as a society, probably value, like safety and human well-being. And I think if that trend continues, where AI is used in more and more consequential spaces, used in decision-making that affects people's life outcomes, potentially, we may see a shift towards standards becoming requirements, like codified requirements in some way through legislation. However, this is speculation and Congress does move quite slowly. But to their credit, they are thinking about AI and really what are the issues that Congress should be, should be prioritizing as the technology evolves. I suppose as a, a means of, of starting to tie a bow on our conversation here, congressional lawmakers have a certain function and then executive branch governmental actors, they also have their functions here. From your perspective, what are some sort of near-term things that both of those groups should really be focused on and looking at so that they don't get 
caught in some traps and would help advance the standards perspective and driving at some of those test and evaluation frameworks that look like a means of really trying to keep this within the guardrails that I think people sort of intuitively know is really important. So the executive branch and the legislative branch really need to be in sync on making sure that provisions that are laid out in executive orders, such as the one signed by President Biden last year, that those are backed up by money and by funding and resources. And so, yes, the National Institute of Standards and Technology has been tasked with so many things in this executive order, and they are actually not a huge agency, and they are somewhat strapped for resources. And so what Congress can do is actually sort of authorize and appropriate funding um, for these agencies and make sure that they're able to sort of really put teeth to some of the requirements and and the high-level goals that have been um, laid out in the executive order. And then follow up to that longer term, do you think that government is the right place to steward these standards or do you think it's more of a industry representation group like uh, IEEE that you mentioned earlier or more of like a public-private partnership kind of model that would look to share that responsibility across a number of different sectors? There are lots of different actors that engage in very different ways in the standards landscape right now. So the United States advocates for a voluntary consensus-based standards and supports industry playing a, a really active role in developing those standards. Other parts of the world take a slightly different approach where standard setting agencies really rely kind of more heavily on government actors to provide input. And so I think it's going to need to be a combination of everyone. Industry should be at the table because they are the ones building this cutting edge technology. And they have the insights that many people on the outside don't have. And so they are integral players in this space. But government should also um, have a say. NIST does plenty of pre-standardization work. Now, they're not um, actually a standard-setting body, but they do a lot of sort of research around measurement science, and they do a lot of kind of the core technical work that's needed to start building standards. And so all of these different stakeholders are going to have to come to the table and have a discussion. I think the challenge is how do we make sure that one group isn't overrepresented in the discussion? How do we get, say, members from civil society to talk about this? And NIST has done actually, I think, a laudable job of bringing people to the table, especially when through the development of their AI risk management framework. There are organizations that think very deeply about this and I'm taking steps forward. My last question for you here today, in addition to following the, the Center for Security and Emerging Technology for our audience members who are really interested in this subject of standards making, what other sort of resources would you recommend that they try to keep current with in order to stay a part of the conversation? I would say, so there is a researcher who I have admired and followed closely for some time. Her name is Deb Raji, and she has done work on AI evaluations and sort of how benchmarks that actually test for very narrow capabilities have sort of been lauded by researchers as a test for all sorts of things that actually aren't in scope. So it, they've sort of been turned into a catch-all for all kinds of sort of evaluations of what an AI system can do, when really they're testing sort of how an AI system performs on a very narrow task with very specific metrics. So she's a very interesting researcher to watch in this space. Awesome. Thank you for that. I mean, I want to thank you for your time today. This was a really fascinating conversation, but any final words or thoughts here? Thank you so much for having me. If I have one final word to give to policymakers and listeners, it would be that gaining insight into how these systems work is really invaluable. And several ways to do that 
are through incident reporting and evaluation reporting requirements. These are tools that can help us better assess safety claims that are made by AI producers and also a better understand where further investigation and more policies and safeguards are needed. Thank you again, Mina. Really appreciate all of your valuable wisdom and insights today to our audience. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Max. AI, Government and the Future is brought to you by Corner Alliance. To find out more about Corner Alliance and how we work with government to create results, visit our website at corneralliance.com and then make sure to search for AI Government Future in Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts or anywhere else podcasts are found and click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Corner Alliance, thanks for listening.